This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch and Tim Doll, episode number 207. Unbelievable. Hello, Timothy. Hello. Hello. So I'm back. We're, we're both back in uh, New York and uh, kind of dealing with just getting back and doing our stuff here. Um, well, it's interesting. We left on the worst air quality day and now tomorrow, I mean, then then. We'll see now. It's Chicago be so again the worst. Chicago the last few days has had the worst. Yeah, so worse the, than Dubai. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 so Chicago is what it kind of had what we had a couple couple weeks ago. So we'll see if that if that jet stream brings it right back to us. Um, well, it's it, the humidity is high. It's not too healthy. The whole fucking planet suffering. What can I say? It's yeah. And and so speaking of which, and you yeah, know, yeah, er, er, and of you, course, and you just got back yourself, luckily, uh, on a flight that got in, as opposed to the thousands that are not. Well, those international flights, they kind of push those ones through. And yeah, I, I don't think uh, I was flying from Berlin. Where the fuck are they going to go? <laughs> you know, so it's like they have to let those ones in. So, I mean, they're going to fly back to Berlin by the time they get to uh, Canada. So, so no, um, but I got in and it was uh, fine. It was a fine fucking flight. I mean, I, I the, the air airports, the air, air, airlines, all of it's kind of stinks. But I, as, as you as you know, you witness well, every time, you know, I have to bring my fucking base on and, and they're giving people less and less and less rights. And the thing is, it's just a shakedown for money because. The base fits above no problem, but they try to, but I've had it, but I somehow use my little, uh, little, little yeah, yeah. And, and, and the, the last one, it was so strange. Um, this person was just like shaking down everyone and, 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 and making these, these girls are crying and you have to pay more money and you, this doesn't fit. It's like a little backpack. I'm like, Oh my God, you guys. And I just didn't, I, you know, I was like, well, how am I going to behave? This person's really by the book. And I just was silent. I walked up and we made eye contact. And he just said, go ahead. Just go now. Just, just get out of here. You know? It's yeah. all in the eyes. So, so it well, worked. I mean, you know, flights, cars, trains. I mean, the problem with, and now, of course, I mean, we have talked about this. The I-95 out of Philadelphia, the freeway oh collapsing. But how about the train derailment on a Montana bridge sends multiple rail cards into the Yellowstone River. Hooray. Yeah, collapsed. Damaged rail cars were carrying molten sulfur and ash. Oh, great, great. Yeah. yeah. So, and two cars were carrying sodium hydrogen sulfate. Oh, yeah. Well, they'll be checking for what's happening on there. And of course, they were also leaking petroleum products, which is in everything, which is why we all have cancer and hazmat will be there. But not only that, I mean, the thing is, we, you know, I take trains in Europe all the time, which are great. I mean, I'm not taking, you know, I'm not on the freight cars, but you, I rarely worry about anything. And then just, you know, two days ago, an Amtrak in, in Los Angeles uh, derailed. Yeah, well, you know, basically, uh, eh, the ones in Germany are, are always uh, being criticized. I mean, the. That basically anything that has a big automobile industry or is kind of connected with that or oil, they, they don't really like they don't like the uh, the train system. Let's put but it I that mean, way. Amtrak, I mean, first of all, it's so overpriced. It's so ill run. I mean, it's like so many issues of public safety in this country, which are just or, or yeah, public life in general, which are overlooked and are being profited out to individual corporations that don't give a shit and don't take care of things. So Amtrak services between Ventura and Los Angeles suspended since the train is on the tracks. You know, what are you going to do about it? I mean, yes. walking, is that safe? I'm not even... Well, depends where you are, but not. Like bus, not really. Not, maybe. not, not particularly. Not particularly. I mean, holographic um, performances might be the next thing. Well, where it's, where it's definitely not safe is Florida. Um, a man uh, shot 30 rounds uh, at, at the pool man. The pool guy showed up. He showed up a couple hours late. And then the wife uh, was like, someone's breaking in. And this, this guy, retired colonel, just in 90 seconds, unleashed 30 rounds. Now, the guy, he didn't hit the guy. Uh, he shattered all his glass. The guy ran away, had shrapnel glass in him. But he's like, what the fuck? And, and, and there's recordings of like the nine the uh 9 11 operator saying stop shooting just stop <laughs> it so and of course it was some in some kind of 
kind of hick area of Florida. So um, it, so the sheriff's like, well, it was lawful, but but awful. I mean, we're, uh, not, and, 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 we're not prejudiced about Florida. We go. I go there. We go there all the I time. I have a lot of great friends there. I can enjoy but, it. But, but, but this is what ridiculous. a fucked up fucking place. And I mean, even more fucked up with I don't know if you heard about the latest uh, just Satan is what I'm going to call him. You know, he, he's trying to pass this law that corporations do not have to abide by local policies. And if they want to go to court, say, and take the city or the town or the county to trial because they don't like, you know, perhaps safety measures that might be imposed by a town, a county or a city, that the city, if it loses, that means the taxpayers have to pay the corporate uh, lawyer fees. Oh my God. And this is just something I'm that fucking, I mean, fucking what a- asshole. I mean, the, these, this is just getting. I mean, so out it, of for, I mean for, for, from uh, basically almost uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, definitely from FTR to um, Ralph Nader in terms of consumers' rights. I mean, I mean, these these were hard fought victories for the people and and the just the spiteful reaction. Well, yeah, well, and, and even, like, look, uh, even on a news show, one of the Desa- Satan's. You know, um, allies was interviewed and they even asked directly. So you mean that the taxpayers will have to pay the legal fees of a corporation? He said, yeah, that's what I mean. So, I mean, they're not even trying to lie about this. No, no, and the policies in Florida are becoming so treacherous, which is just, you know, well, the way a lot of he's this- going against he's going against the tour- tourism industry. So, I mean, it, it, you know, he's he's an idiot. He, he, well, you know, Florida, he's uh, making a lot of problems for people in Florida, but this is he's trying to play the, the national game and 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 he's really hoping i mean just like the Republican establishment is hoping for trump to go down well, they, the they only wanna... time i quote liz cheney who said we're electing idiots thank you well you listen <laughs> if trump goes down and if he doesn't run and DeSantis runs he's gonna he, i think he's gonna beat biden uh he, i mean it's not the first time someone does wicked and dumb runs on wicked and dumb policies and they've won i mean well it, i mean it, and biden biden dementia daddy just said yeah, you know, Russia and Iran, he's like claiming that they're attacking Iran. He doesn't even know where he stays. No, no. They, they, steps well, really the Democratic doesn't Party doesn't is. Democratic Party doesn't believe in democracy. We have no choice. Right. He he's he represents us. We we the people couldn't choose who they wanted to represent them. And and that's a huge gamble. It's a, it's not just a national security yeah, issue. Yeah, it's no, an it's international ridiculous. security issue. And that's Look, just to sustain the as power. Bad as the other. One is as bad as the other. This is not a democracy. If you think it is, good luck. The, 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 the bonus is, other than on a policy level, which is important to some of our lives, we still can create outside of their wackitude some kind of life. And But the thing is, many people suffer. Millions will say uh, more than half of the 350 million people suffer from these outrageous, selfish, greedy, corporate, pro-corporate policies. I don't know where it's going to end. So, well, so let's, here's another fun thing. This, I, and I see this as gaslighting. Do you hear about this new proposed uh, re- regulations on, on pizza places in, <laughs> uh, in New York? And so, if, so if you're, you know, the classic, Neapolitan pizza is with a, a coal or, or wood oven, brick oven uh, stove. New and York so, is known for its pizzas. Oh, and, and, and that is kind of the best way. Now, they they want to they basically ever since, you know, those those fires in the bad air, like, oh, we, we need to we need to like care about the environment now. Yeah, right. Yeah, so and, let, let's go after pizza. Oh, yeah, go, yeah, parlors. Go, not, not the not the oil industry. Not no, not, 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 not the not the car industry. Nope, We're going nope. after pizza parlors. And, and then of course start, this is where they, they don't want to see it. They're, they're it's gonna, the trickle up theory. The trickle up theory. Well, they're gonna demand this like twenty thousand dollar filtration system for all these places. But the, but they were talking to the guy from Gamaldi's, he goes, Well, that's gonna change a different airflow. So we probably will end up using like twice as much coal just to just to actually have the the, the product the way we well, want it. There I was mean, one there was one wackadoodle at City Hall throwing pizzas at it. But I mean, again, bottom up as opposed to top down policies. No, no. That, that, again, this is ridiculous. this is ga- gaslighting. It, it, it's just like when um, when like NPR idiots were, were really in the, the 90s, like recycle, recycle. And they're like, oh, no, no. No, 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 no. The oil industry is making it your responsibility, the consumer. The consumer didn't ask for millions of plastic bottles. We have fine drinking water. We didn't ask for it. Now it's our responsibility. It's the same thing. It's gaslighting onto the fucking people. And it's well, fucking I, I so transparent. Say, I, I have to say, 
the plastic water bottle is one of the greatest fucking scams oh, ever yeah. invented in <laughs> I know, history. I know. Because first of all, you're sucking down leached <laughs> plastic. Hello. And then it is not recyclable. And the thing is, get a fucking bamboo charcoal, get a metal or glass water bottle, drink water at fucking home. You're being charged for shit. You don't well, I mean, for the mo- and most of the time. Most of the time, whether it's Coca Cola or you know, or or, or Nestle or whoever, they, oh, right. they're, 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 ta- they're, ta- they're taking it. They're taking it from our own water, and then they're Hello. charging us for our own water. Biggest scam on the planet, and people don't realize. And they leave the water bottles in their car, and they're warm, and they're full of fucking shit. And that's the way it is. It's because you know they don't really fucking care. Now, well, uh, you know, well, look, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. They don't care. Well, well, speaking of water, I, I have one more ahead. start. Oh, yeah. Uh, Matt Sprutenberg of Sacramento, he hardworking man. He likes to kind of. Where we'll be in July at yeah, the yeah, Scarlet Room. I'll probably be pretty, pretty be hot. Again. So he likes his little recreation on the weekends is to go scuba diving. So he goes to Lake Natoma and he was kind of down there checking shit out. And he found a prosthetic leg and I, with, a, with a shoe on it. And then he's like, what the fuck? And so then he brought his little treasure. He brought it and he's like, ah, this is a long shot, but I'm going to go on social media and like anyone lose a leg. And at some point, a woman got contacted him and said, well, I think that's my husband. I think it's my leg. I think, well, my husband was uh, paddle boarding on that lake a year ago and it flipped over and he lost his leg. So uh, he lost about his the- fake leg, lost his fake leg. So, so okay. you know, sort of like those kind of like strangers meet up after someone does a good deed or discovers something. Right. Oh, you found, found my, my wedding Message ring. In a bottle for you know, all that. So, yeah. Right. Well, I think he's, they're going to meet up. They're going to hug over this leg. Well, I'd like <laughs> to hug all of these guys in Nicaragua who are following a 400 year old tradition where dozens lash each other with dried bull penises. Yeah, I've heard of this. Heard I, think. I've heard. I mean, it's, it's some kind of it's held to mark the St. John the Baptist Day in San Juan de Orenti, a municipality in the south of Central American country. So challengers who don't wear protective gear and are sometimes topless lash each other with chilitos and chilitos waiting on a second. It's no chilitos, which are made with dissected <laughs> penis of a bull okay so there are videos of the event and they show how the weapon is capable of ripping a piece of skin on contact with scores of competitors sustaining cuts and other injuries i mean this is brutal fighting here and there you go again men you wonder why they call you men (laughs) because (laughs) you're ridiculous hello no pun intended hello if i'm gonna (laughs) well I can't say I'm not against the thought of beating someone with, with a bull penis, but I mean, I don't just don't know where to get one. Well, that would be ridiculous. Hello. It uh, would be. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, my God. Well, anyway, uh, that's one way to spend the weekend. I don't know about you, but I might be. Uh... So <laughs> we'll just say in this one village, about 60 percent of the 3000 inhabitants are said to have pro- partaken in the sport during their lifetime. So apart, quote, apart from our traditions, part of our promises. Of course it hurts, but at the moment is being forged. He's been fighting this half his life, all for St. John the Baptist. You know, nothing like a bit of torture for something and someone that does not exist. (laughs) Holy fucking teenage Jesus Christ. Yes. Other than that, I'm just prepping up for our uh, big West Coast adventure. That's, that would be- in, that's in three three weeks, and I'm psyched to be doing it. Gonna so be fun. It will be. So, with that said, I think we're gonna close out and go cool off because I don't know about you, but my skin is hot. It's a little sweaty it's in here. Pretty, it's pretty, pretty, pretty moist. It's the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Doll, episode two hundred seven with our guest today. Novelist Nolan Knight. This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and our guest today, Nolan Knight, who has a new book out called Gallows Dome. His previous books, The Neon Lights Are Veins and 
beneath the black palms. But I was very interested in this quote from Tony O'Neill, who I've done some shows with in the past, and I know you're doing a performance with him or a reading in New York in a, in a month or so. And this is what he what he what he called Gallows Dome, which then you're going to read us a part of. It's a hard boiled, pitch dark and yet weirdly funny caper, which rolls into town from somewhere out in the literary hinterlands. If you like your writing with dirt under the nails, then let me introduce you to Nolan Knight. I'm not that. Uh -huh. Take it away, Nolan. Thanks for having me, Lydia. With the sun, his god, Repo Helm knew better than to curse a giant star for California's dead soil. Arid farmland had brought prosperity, for him at least, albeit fleeting. His pistachio ostrich boots kicked through pits in what used to be a healthy apple grove. He was meeting with the orchard's owner to discuss why their business had spoiled worse than his harvest. A lone acre ripe with pink ladies glistened under moonlight up ahead, its Chris scent churning Repo's guts. After all these years, the prospect of violence still made him hungry. He wiped sweat from his goatee and brow, adjusting the weary trucker's cap. A picnic table sat at the heart of the lush grove. Standing before it was the owner, Willis, a tall drink of water and a bone Stetson. As Repo approached, Willis met him with an outstretched palm. Shaking the man's hand, he noticed a large boy holding a rifle beyond. My grandson, said Willis. Caught him out here taking aim at railroad signs back that way. Repo nodded to the boy, looked to be in his late teens a linebacker. The kid leaned the rifle on the table at his grandpa's request. Hope it didn't take you long to drive down, Mr. Helm. Easy coast from Greenfield to San Miguel, but you know that. This time of day, I suppose. Six car pileup yesterday, pregnant gal lost her baby, another fellow lost an arm. Well, uh, we all have our stories. Indeed, Mr. Helm, he pointed to the boy. Ours began here four generations ago, one of the most bountiful farmlands in California for a spell now, look at her. He removed his cap, head wagging, all them politics, signed water rights, and damn drought, what have you. Trying to teach the boy here that no one can ballpark what the future holds anymore. Not much reward for hard work these days either. Repo pierced through the man's banter with an empty gaze. You've come down because our relationship has hit an impasse, correct? He didn't flinch. Well, that's a shame, really. Though he has a good thing going. You supply the goods me and my boys deliver. Repo inched closer. Where's the money? Willis nodded to his grandson. The kid pulled a briefcase from under the picnic table and slid it over. Do I need to open it again? Tell me. It's all there. What took you so long? Some of the product never made it to its final destination. I had to track it down like a wounded elk. Funny, Repo leaned in. That's not what I heard. Oh, really? Do tell. I hear you got a problem in my new endeavor. Feel conflicted working for me and all of a sudden was about to pinch and cut loose and got cold feet. Willis smiled, exposing missing molars. I never once saw you as a boss, Mr. Helm. Always thought us moving your dope as being independent contractors. Equals, really. Ain't nothing equal here between us, Repo turned to the boy. Don't you reach for that fucking rifle. From behind a patch of trees emerged a slim black figure, pistol in hand. A shadow stealthily approached out of sight to Willis and the boy. Repo had told his elder cohort, X, to survey the grounds as an added precaution, and there he was, right on time, as always. Repo's shoulders eased. He plucked an apple off a tree, admiring its shine. What's on your mind, Willis? It's true what they say about this gallows dome? Depends what they say. Say you preaching a one-way ticket to the end of days using some of this drug money to hold an ungodly ceremony. They plan on starting a hedonistic church. You heard wrong, Willis. I've had my go of religion. It didn't take. And the dome ain't gonna pose a threat for anyone in these parts. How you figure? The dome ain't a problem. It's a solution. <laughs> yeah. That's only the beginning of the devastation that follows. <laughs> you grew up in Los Angeles or around the area. Yeah, I find it one of the most noir places in America, actually. Yeah, I mean, every three blocks is pretty noir. Seems to be get, getting more, more extreme, or although it's maybe less extreme than a year ago. But uh... I always felt Santa Monica <laughs> Boulevard, the stretch where there used to be a lot of the gay hookers, was the boulevard of broken dreams and carnage. Every little neighborhood's got its things. You know, um, I always say that, like, uh, to me, the... Har what's going on in Harbor City right now is probably more interesting to me than what's going on in the Hollywood Hills, you know, um, more meaningful, too. Yeah. Where, where have you lived around the Los Angeles so, area? Uh, yeah, I was born in the South Bay, uh, Torrance Redondo Beach area. And then um, I went to school in Long Beach uh, College. Then I uh, lived up in Los Feliz for a long time. Um, then uh, back to the South Bay for a minute. And now I'm back in Long Beach. A little more pleasant out there, a little more pleasant. Well, I mean, Lo Long Beach is pretty is, is pretty insane. In fact, on many levels, including it being one of the most uh, 
busy ports in the world. And yeah. uh, I know it got pretty crazy with the whole supply chain thing, but you, you have, you have nice areas and then you got like really rough stuff. It's kind of a, it's kind of, a, I, I, I've only spent a little bit of time there, but I'm like, Whoa, this is something else. It's, it's, it's a micro metropolis is what I like to think of it. And uh, yeah, you know, what streets to walk up and which streets not to, you know, um, right now we're in starting tourist season and you're starting to see, you know, some people walking down some questionable streets with backpacks and black socks, you know, and it's kind of like you want to turn them around, but um, you also want them to uh, experience it's, it's, it. I think. Yeah. I mean, well, they got, they got the map, not me, you know, but uh, it's a, uh, it's, it's uh, every day is uh, something new, you know, you used to write for the LA record and what, what would you cover then? And what was the music you were into when you were, you know, a teenager? Okay, well, uh, when I wrote for the record, I did uh, all their film stuff. So it was like uh, reviews, previews, um, a lot of the stuff for revival houses, New Beverly Cinema, Cine Family when it was around. And then um, I'd cover the small film festivals like Don't Knock the Rock and things like that. And then as it went on, I started doing interviews and it was a lot of um, cult, cult icons like uh, Sid Haig and... Um, uh, Clint Howard and Allison Andrews, all these, all these great people. And um, I did that for a number of years, but uh, that basically just got me into any type of show I wanted to see in the city. Well, would you say that, would you say that film was bi a bigger influence on you than music? Because certainly literature was a bigger influence on me than music. Yeah. Film at an early age was, was big. It was real big. Um, my whole life, it was just watching old movies, you know, my, formative years are just filled with Avon Costello meets Frankenstein and stuff like that. And um, as I got older, the independent cinema wave hit when I was in high school and I would just live at the video store, worked at one for a minute. And then didn't, uh, when didn't, I was, didn't, didn't a lot of people we know at one minute. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I have a, like a gold card from the place I worked at. Cause it was a, you know, you went, when I rented over a thousand movies one time or something like that. I don't know. It's uh, <laughs> I still have that thing, but um, music wise, I got into. Well, let's let's go, let's stick to film. Let's stick to film oh, for sure. a minute, though, first, because there's a lot to discuss on that. So, I mean, like with literature, like with music and with film, obviously you go through phases because you have to glut on what your obsession is at the moment. So what starting with horror, then what noir, then, you know, independent, then. Yeah, I had. um I had some relatives that had a VHS and they were always bringing in new movies. So it was kind of whatever was there. It was a lot of universal horror. And then it would lead into um, eighties action movies. It, the more obscure, the better, you know? Um, and then when I got, um, you know, I, I got into the nineties, it was anything that kind of resembled my neighborhood, you know, type thing, uh, you know, uh, like, what? Go, like uh, interesting. Well, not my direct neighborhood, but in my child's mind, I would watch like a Hal Hartley movie and I would think like, oh, this must be a couple of cities over or something, you know, and um, so it was very easy to tap into the source um, of thinking that um, film wasn't just for uh, mega corporations. It was for everybody. Do you write thinking, do you think that film, well, of course, because your writing is very cinematic. I mean, it is, it's, I'm going to, I just thought of the term gutter noir. I don't know. I never heard that before, <laughs> but I'll give it to you if you want. I'll say gutter noir. That's a pretty <laughs> damn good one. Oh man. I'm like, we can share it. We can share it. Because a good book is a film on page. And when a film that's really good from a book, not often, but it can be, I'm just going to give the example. Sometimes, sometimes instance, they're better, rarely, but sometimes they're better than the book. I, well, Requiem for a Dream. I'm the not a fan of either. And the okay. movie. The I'm not book, a fan of either. The book and the movie are Devastations mm -hmm. by Hubert Selby. Yeah. Oh, I, the book, that book affected me profoundly when I first read it. Everyone that it's a nervous breakdown on page. It is one of Selby's best books. And I don't know anybody who read it that didn't have a near nervous breakdown. And that's hard to accomplish in a mere whatever 130, whatever it is. It's not a long book. Um, you know, and Selby being very to dare to my heart, absolute big influence and having the pleasure of, you know, taking him on tour, et cetera. But um, yeah, Requiem for Jim. Here's about, a question for both of you. What about American Psycho? Which one do you prefer more, the movie or the book? Um, I'll make an admission. I've never read the book. I've seen the movie about 10 times. But um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Well, that, that settles that one. 
Uh, yeah. No, I think that's that's it's pretty that's a pretty good. It's hard to define because Christian Bale is so good in everything he does, of course. And Brett Ellis, Easton, Easton Ellis, um, I've always had a problem with him, but the book is still good because one thing about him, in opposed to as opposed to Gaspar Noe, whose films often irritate me with their banality and then excite me with their violence, and it's the kind of same with. American Psycho and the Huey Lewis bullshit, which, by the way, forced me and Sylvia Black to cover I Want a New Drug in a very different way. <laughs> um, uh, I was just thinking of The Killer Inside Me by Jim Thompson and Casey Affleck. That's a pretty intense, pretty intense. And Jim Thompson, I mean, it's interesting because Jerry Stahl just asked me to recommend a Jim Thompson book to him. And I was like, well, Killer Inside Me, Pop 1, 1280. They're all good. Yeah. I'm oh, a grifters show, show. guy. Jim what, Thompson no? Grifters and the movie both are solid. Um, the format of the book with like a, you know, um, a three person volley to this crash of a climax was big on me. And then to watch the movie screenplay by Donald Westlake and just nail it, you know, Stephen Frears. Um, yeah, I, I mean, uh, it's hard to come by that though. A good well, balance. I have to say, like, just shooting sideways, one of my favorite. I don't, beyond noir because it's a real story one of my favorite books in that genre is uh uh james elroy my dark places mm -hmm. that's just to me that's the topper because it is life noir yeah it's haunting it's a haunting novel and uh it's not for the faint of heart you know but it's well and, it's, and it's anybody that doesn't know about it it's basically his mother was murdered and in comparison to the black dahlia i mean this is where he draws and it just he also exposes his own perversity he's 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 a hard nut all the way around <laughs> yeah that's that one way I, mean, I, I mean the shining i don't know if you, i've never even i read part of the book but i never got through it yeah but that's a radically different movie than the book radically yeah radically the book's pretty meandering it's it's all there though you know um i haven't recently rewatched this writing in a while but uh i would imagine it, it's almost impossible to go page for page because i think yeah. it's like 900 pages or something like that you know right i never read the shining um i don't read the only i stopped reading horror with um shirley jackson's <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. 13. Do you like bad I'm movies always disappointed with horror huh. except for saw <laughs> Oliver Williams. i love uh, saw <laughs> I do love so. What, what about bad movies? I mean, when you're a, a video store kid, and I mean, you're addict. Just, you're, you're, he's like, he was you're, an addict. Yeah, he's a, a, a thousand. He's like the Mile High Club of right, video. Right. No, I know. I, I get. I get it. So, so there's. I wouldn't know if there's a, if it's a Stockholm syndrome or, or just how because there, there's just way more bad movies than there are good movies. Uh, just like anything, basically. But is it Stockholm syndrome, or is it uh, just the um, cynicism? Is it uh, or just f finding things to to, to like and even if the whole macro thing is bad and just like oh I, that's kind of interesting that's kind of or a, do you not waste yeah. your fucking time on bad movies yeah Funny. you could it's very easy um i got into bad movies from um remembering going to video stores when i was a kid and we only could rent one movie and every movie i wanted to see was ridiculous you know like um lyle alzado as the destroyer and he's like holding a, a chainsaw or something or um you know re a return of the uh, the aliens deadly spawn and all this stuff and then a couple uh, like right when i got into high school all that stuff went away but i was picking it up like a quarter on ebay and i would just wide binge watch all this and most of them were, were totally garbage but i had to know you know i had to know if the cover of the of the box big box vhs met up with the content and right. it never does you know no i, I see I, I was lucky because i grew up when there were still drive-ins and drive-ins had i mean those films also I mean, Last House on the Left. I saw that at the drive. -in. Cool. I mean, and yeah. it was harsh. And oh, I love understatement. it. Understatement. Yeah. In 35. And terrible you know, music. Terrible music in that period. Oh, God. Oh, at, it's, it's rough. At, at this point, I basically, I only watch movies on the plane. Uh, I, you know, I, I have my opinion about movies in general. I think uh, it's they're not the, the most impressive thing. There's some excellent ones, but for the most part, uh -huh. not, they, they, they kind well, of. Especially now, though. Especially it's, now. It, I watch it on the plane. TV and I, is better. But I can't make such an all, uh, arrogant uh, uh, statement like that unless I know about it. So I do watch them. And mm. uh, and on the plane, I watch and I watch a bunch just recently and, and they pretty much all stunk. It was uh, I, okay. it, you know, it, what was good on the plane. And it's strange because Kay Shea and I both watched it fall. And it's about this female 
this this woman and her boyfriend are going like freestyle mountain climbing. He <laughs> he drops, he dies, and then her and her girlfriend, her girlfriend goes, "You got to get out of this front. You got to get. We're gonna go climb this tower in the middle of nowhere." And it's fucked up. And it's kind of like <laughs> 127 hours. And I have to say, I enjoy watching any TV show or movie where stupid people do things I might never, ever fucking do, especially if it's dangerous. So, like, so, yeah. so, so the difference between a, <laughs> the difference between a bad song and a bad movie, a bad song's done in five minutes it, yeah. uh, where, where a movie's done in, in an hour and a half. It's like the it's like the panhandler, like, you know, one person going, hey, do you have 50 cents? The other person's like, let me tell you my story and blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, you're wasting my fucking time. OK, speaking yeah. about a panhandler, my favorite was some guy came up to me. Yo, can I hold five dollars? Can I hold five dollar? I go. Uh, can I hold your fucking firstborn? I don't ah. think so. How long are you gonna hold it for? I don't think so. No, you can't. How about five dollars and pennies? So Forget what's am- what's amazing is you being a video store junkie and uh, you know blah, blah, blah. Well, no, no, but 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 you know, there's movies are about a hundred and thirty years old, and so you kind of can get through. I mean, music, on the other hand, is thousands of years old, even notated music, you know, so I mean, no one would get through all the music that's been made. It's impossible. And well, so yeah. there's there's just so much endless, uh, okay, so the, endless good supply. Point, Tim. We're going to go back to what music you were listening to in between your film slut dumb. Me? Oh, that um, would be you. In high, in high school, you're saying, or just whatever? Just, yeah, whatever music you, you first got into and the progression of, of where that went or where you are now with it, yeah. Well, growing up, I was a big skateboarder, and um, so skateboard videos were a big influence. And then that was, you know, punk rock, hip hop. Um, I started probably like in middle school with Beastie Boys that slowly got me into, uh, well, be, living in the South Bay, it's not hard to get right into, you know, Descendants and Circle Jerks and Black Flag and places. But these dudes. Yeah, well, the and South then, Bay um, still has great rap radio, though, which I don't know if it exists in New York, but the radio is still does. really good rap stuff playing in, in L.A. radio. Yeah. Is, when you're yeah. in the car, that better be good. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then um, a lot of that... Is it, isn't I, your one, isn't their book um, uh, about a skateboarder, The Neon Lights, uh, Our Veins? Is that yeah, about the first, Yeah, the debut is about a, an age pro, like '80s era skateboarder who's on the outs, living in a um, in a mixed bag uh, motel in uh, the Rampart District of Los Angeles. Oh yeah, Rodney King. I a lot of the music I came across, uh, I was while I was working at the LA Record because they they're they're 100 music, so I'd come across Rocky Erickson and, and guys like um, Dex Romweber and these people that. Uh, I'd either have to interview or they'd come through town and go see him. And it was like a, uh, an awakening, you know, period. That was in my twenties. Um, and nowadays I'm, I always have my ear to the, the street, listening to anything that comes out from local places like in the red or um, Ty Siegel's outfit, uh, God records. Stuff in, like in, that. in the red records, you mean, do you mean in the red records? Yeah. Yeah. yeah they're still indie labels. Do you, when you're writing, and this is interesting because I never listen. I rarely listen to music unless somebody's over here and I want to drown their fucking voice out. But, um, you know, writers have different methods of everything. And I, it's I I think it was Jerry Stahl or I don't know who it was. So they actually listened to he- like heavy, dark, hard metal while writing. I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah. Some people listen to classical. Others listen to jazz. When you're writing, do you listen to anything? No. And no, when you're no. actually no doing the no, work. My neighborhood's loud enough. You know, like I get, I get enough soundtrack from the alley, um, but uh, no, and I'm not one of these like I got. I need complete silence, people either. Um, I can kind of tune in um, accordingly, but uh, I'll edit to music sometimes. But if I do, it's usually something you know, not too. Uh, it's not going to amp me up too much. You know, listen to some Art Pepper or something. You know, I you know a lot of painters, a lot of artists work to music. I, I can never relate. I would just find it so distracting. I, I, I you know, I, I'm kind of like, well, I mean, you, know, it, you know, you don't want to watch a, a film while you're writing music, Tim. <laughs> not, re- <laughs> not, not really. But, but when motherfuckers talk at the concert, I, I'd be like, well, people, if you're in a movie theater, you're not like, Hey, so what's going on today? I mean, a lot of people treat music as background, which I get. I'm not, you know, that's why I like people to sit down because it, ha- it shows more respect. <laughs> <laughs> So it's so going back to your process. So yeah, you just kind of just sit down, and write. Do you write every day? Um, well, it depends on what I'm doing. I don't write every day. Um, I'll, if I'm writing, if I'm in a novel, then 
I tend to go like six days a week just to stay in it. And we're all right in the mornings, go through work or whatnot, and then um, edit in the afternoon. But that's just basically to carry me back into the next morning. So then my head's like still when you the say When you say in the morning, what does that mean? Because I understand. I mean, sometimes when I'm when I'm working on a, it's like 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. Then yeah. I have to do the normal the shit that helps me to survive, like, you know, reality check. But um, Harry yeah. Cruz used to write at 3 a.m. Wake up. Right. What it's, about it's you? Whenever what? I can. You know, it's whenever I can. And right now I'm, I'm in between uh, gigs doing like some contracting stuff. So I have a little bit more free time. What do you mean by contracting stuff? Subcontracting stuff. I'm doing a, like a, I worked in real estate appraisal for a long time. And um, so right now I'm just taking odds and ends jobs before landing. Well, because a house. writer, like a musician, it's not necessarily a profitable profession to have. No, no. No matter how good the book is, <laughs> no matter how yeah. good the book is, or the music is, it's not that problem. Yeah, no, what is it's... Down and Out Books, which is the label that Gallows Dome is out on? Is this a new label? Is it kind of like the West Coast of Cash or what is it? I don't know. No, they've been around for about, I want to say, 13 years. They're based in Florida and it's a crime fiction uh, outfit. They put out two to four books a month, a lot of anthologies wow. and stuff, but they, uh, they're just kind of firing on all cylinders. They, they put out, um, anything that falls under the umbrella of crime as far as like noir here or even like detective series work, but um, they've been great uh, working with them. Do you watch any, uh, do you watch a lot of crime series on TV or forensics? Yeah, I tend to like relax watching a lot of that stuff, you know. I, I cannot I, go to I, sleep I, without I, forensics. <laughs> I you get relax with for, forensics? For uh, the, yeah, the date, I watch uh, Datelines and you know, I mean, how can you yeah, not? Wait, 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 Dateline? It's very good. Yeah. Dateline. Yeah. A couple of what, episodes. I'll be asleep without it. I can't go to sleep. What, what about frontline? Do you, what about frontline? Do you ever. Frontline's it? heavy. It depends on what the, what the issue. Episode I, is. Yeah. It's kind of too, too well, That Tim, reality Tim, is pretty Tim, heavy. I mean, Tim is not necessarily a forensic freak like us. He likes inside edition, which <laughs> that's, my, that's my favorite show. Yeah. Um, Dateline, uh, forensic files, seen them all, cold case files, yeah. seen them all. Um, the new, there's a new Hillside Strangler three part <laughs> up. Yeah. yeah, I gotta go to sleep to forensics, I'm just saying, because I don't have time to read it anymore. Or do I? I'm not so sure. I mean, looking at a copy of The Killer Inside Me, which is staring at me from across the other side of the room, it's a tattered paperback version with a really good, really good cover. I'm going to hold it up for you. You got to see yeah. this. You got to see this bad boy. Uh-oh, here it comes. Well, I mean, who could, re who could resist the that one? Oh, yeah. He sees. Awesome. Oh, oh, God, it's falling. He's been abused. Yeah. I, maybe I took the cover to bed with me a few times too many. I'm not sure. <laughs> could be, could be not. So, all right, so... Yeah, writers like musicians, it's got to be jugglers, got to have any number of jobs. So now when you set out so Gallows Dome, interesting also, I mean, I don't know if you followed, how, how could you not, you're, you're out there, the heinous Scientology nonsense, and finally somebody got busted, Danny Masterson, thank you very much, for raping mm. women. But at the same time, recently, articles have come up that you know, it's been since 2007 that the wife of the head of Scientology has been missing in action. And actually, a, a woman frauded to be her. And this is like in 2007 when she disappeared. And the police were so dumb. They took her fingerprints, which did not match. And and they let her go. And they can't find the tape of the restaurant. Probably like, I, I don't know which one. They interviewed her. And now, and now the head of the Scientology is missing. They're trying to serve papers with so and also i mean right now in in california we have marianne williamson another like new age guru running for president i thought she failed once but she's going at it again and her whole thing being you know um we can all be back peace and love for everybody but i hear she's one of the worst people to work for on the planet so mm -hmm. gallows dome back to that and religious cults which are you know one of the most evil things on the planet right under corporations which in some senses, corporations are religious cults. Yeah, it's true. Living in LA, I mean, you had the spiritual revival come come here after the Great Depression, and you just they still make HBO has like Perry Mason, where they did an entire uh, season on like Amy Simple McPherson type, 
you know so it's it's like in the the bloodstream here and um to tell you the truth most cult things like don't really interest me that much but it, it, it's a it's a good um anytime you get a, a bunch of like-minded people that exploit other people uh it's it's propelling to read i think well and it's interesting because this book is based on you know the disappearance and i'm still trying to nail down an exact number of how many people literally in the hundreds of thousands disappear in this country every year to never be seen again and you know the 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 rate of any crime being solved is so minimal. But then you have to say there's 350 million people. How many are just I'm still cross collateralizing statistics on this. But we know a lot of people disappear. A lot of people are snatched off the streets. So there's a lot of land to just throw a body in. And uh, this is the nightmare and the freedom and liberty for none that our country offers. Yeah, the um, this is a topic that is in the newspaper every month, right? It, it's just a different girl or a different um, situation. And uh, I was looking for a hook that was a little bit deeper so I could use more characters and um, taking into consideration and that, that this happens quite frequently. You would have a person watch a TV show and see another person that lives, you know, in Los Angeles. So they can kind of, there's another person in town that's felt, felt their plight. And what did they do when the cops gave up on the case? And that's the whole impetus of the volition of the novel. Yeah, exactly. You know, we don't know how many, we don't know how many murderers, mass murderers, serial killers, schoolyard shooters, just how many violent, deranged, unsatisfied, frustrated men there are in this country that all of us suffer under the auspice of, whether they're politicians, corporations, or fucking killers. It's just the way it is. Welcome to America, asshole. I don't know why everybody wants to come here. As a matter of fact, <laughs> fleeing might not be such a bad. I did it before. Or I'm thinking about doing it again. I could just quote Michonne Burma and say, that's when I reach for my revolver. Problem is, so many men, so few bullets. Oh, that's a joke, right? From Gallows Dome. Another rating by Nolan Knight, the author. The storm's flurry wasn't to blame for Los Angeles County Fire and Rescue calling a halt to their search for Tess Madotti, a Santa Clarita teen believed to have been swept into a current of mud and debris, victim of a severe flash flood. Rescuers have been busy for over 48 hours when the girl's mother, Lena, paused from biting her cuticles beneath the sheriff's canopy and was whisked into the rear of an unmarked sedan. The driver and co-pilot were in plain clothes, badges hanging over hearts. Their eyes darted to the rear view before turning their stone faces to her. Lena gripped a headrest, her chestnut hair dripping wet. Did you find she's she, she she can't be? Shock had zapped all strength, leaving her words floating. Before anything was said to her, Lena went lax, weeping through raindrops about her cheekbones. But young Tess hadn't been found alive or presumed dead, at least not yet. Something had surfaced, shifting all focus on the girl's disappearance. Lena was told she would be taken to headquarters. The entire ride down, she replayed the past two days, trancing on the car's windshield wipers or out her rear window, the moon a smoker's fingernail. She'd risen early on Monday, having to do some further prep before her midday lecture at Cal Arts. As soon as the toaster sprung, she bolted outside, forgoing a customary kiss to her only child, not wanting to wake her. They had been a duo since birth, teammates against the world. This lost kiss was now a writhing worm in the soils of her brain. How was she to know the day could take such a turn? The nightmare began when a new professor interrupted her class. Pardon me, Miss Madotti, I need a word. She excused herself from the classroom. What's up, Stacy? Lock yourself at the office again? The woman's face remained frozen, blush. Well, what the hell is it? There are some gentlemen outside, police officers. They're asking to speak with you. Me? Her brain pinballed every terrible thing she'd ever done. About what? Stacy started to tremble. About your daughter. Whenever rain came to Los Angeles, it was met by 10 million skeptics. With the state still locked in severe drought, its untimely storm held up to expectations, gushing more than barren foothills could handle. Flash flood warnings were put into place, but only after sludge began to slide. The largest section impacting the Santa Cruz Valley ran directly adjacent to Tess's middle school. Normally, when a student was true, the office waited until third period to notify the child's parent or guardian as mental lapses for doctor's appointments and such were often the case. With the sudden flooding being so severe and young Tess never arriving in her first class, they attempted to contact Lena. Lena's phone was shut off for the start of her class. 
When she didn't pick up it, and the faculty at Tess's school felt something was awry, proper authorities were notified, fearing a worst case scenario. As the sedan pulled into the precinct's parking lot, Lena began to shake, knowing damn well the amount of time that had passed and that she was now entering a worst case kingdom. The detectives gave her a blanket and sat her in a cold room with jaundiced walls, one reserved for shackled thugs. She continued to shiver as the black cop wheeled in an ancient television. The second one smelled of Trace Flores, short and obese. He placed coffee before her, its creamy hue matching her skin tone. Lena pushed the cup aside. Can someone just please tell me what the fuck is going on? Exactly. And this is why, and do hear me, women. Every woman needs to have a screech alarm. I do not suggest they have pepper spray or mace because it might blow back in your face. But before, if one second before a nuclear warning of anything might violently happen to you, you release a screech alar alarm, you might just get away. You might have enough time to run away or you might have enough time to poke them in the fucking eyes to get away because women disappear at an increasing level every day in every country across this entire fucking planet. Yeah. Yeah, it's just so, it stat, so 600,000 uh, officially in the United States a year. Yeah, that's that, that's a stat I, I'm trying to double check. And I, I, I read that. 2,000 children a day. Well, Cal I mean, Cal California is number one. Uh, well, it's, you would think it's just by the population. So obviously California is number one, but Florida is number two. And that's not the second biggest fucking state. Uh, and, and, and Florida, I know uh, they well, lie Florida about it. They, they lie insane. about their statistics. They actually lie about their statistics. Uh, so it's probably considerably more. Uh, they do. They, 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 they treat the snowbirds. They treat the people that live there, say, close to six months a year. They don't get they don't take those statistics. They give it to the state that the person is registered in. They do that with COVID. They do it with all their negative shit. So Florida means it's probably it's probably through well, the roof. Well, Timothy Seymour, Dahl and Nolan Knight and everybody else as somebody that would wish we could turn the fucking beat around. Can you imagine if that many men were disappearing every month, every year, every day? I, I haven't well, seen the, I haven't seen the demographic breakdowns, but uh, I wonder. Well, I can with tell you for children sure. Too. I, with children, I can tell you for sure. Other than the happy face killer who is yet to be found, frat boys disappearing in small pods. Well, 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 let's also challenge the statistic. I mean, it's it, um, it's not everyone's being I'm still abducted. Investigating. Not everyone's being abducted. People are leaving their their families. They're doing all types of shit. They're getting running away from debts. They're doing all types of fucking shit. I mean, they just go missing. Their people are on the run. Too. There's a I mean, lot of places to dump a body in this country. And there's a lot of reasons some people feel they will not be satisfied unless they snuff out the life of another person. And that goes back to not only genetics, epigenetics and their parents, but just the madness of the society, which dangles the endless fucking carrot in your face, which you will never actually get a fucking bite of. Incels, beware. I'm a sin cell. Yeah. <laughs> so Just being born a little bit being, of improv poetry for you, Nolan. <laughs> I'm, I'm digress. I'm digressing a little bit, but I'm digressing. Being from Long uh uh Long Beach, um, do you feel connected with historical events in Long Beach? Uh kind of legendary characters from Long Beach. You actually have a yeah, alle um, allegiance to it. I mean, my favorite is uh when John Fonte wrote um ask the dust and uh wait 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 just say that again because it's such a beautiful book and so i mean yeah. Bukowski totally inspired by it ask the dust by john fonte and i knew his son don fonte for a short period now also passed but ask the dust is one of the most beautiful books yeah and, and when his character arturo bandini comes down to long beach and the earthquake happens in 1933 i mean that's the lasting memory um, I live amongst a bunch of historical districts and a lot of these homes they live through, you know, and they got old bones and they, there's a character to it that, um, that always takes me back to that book. Wasn't there a film made with Colin Farrell as yeah. Jante? Yeah. yeah. Robert Town did it, uh, wrote it and directed right. it. Yeah. 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 It was, it was, it was pretty good. Did you by any chance see the film that Jerry Stahl wrote? I keep pumping him today uh, on based on Hemingway and, I think her name was, what was her name? Oh, Gellhorn. Yeah, that was great. That was really great also. She was one of the first like war photographers, Spanish Civil War. That was great. I, who, who was in that? I have Stahl's, um, was it Night Dreams? Is a, is a porno he wrote in the 80s. 
Is it a Night Dreams or Cafe Flesh? I got coffee. Cafe Flesh, but who who was who was in the Hemingway film? Oh, it was uh oh man. I can see his face right now. I know. Clive is it, who? Is it Clive Owen? Clive Owen and Yes, um, it was it was good. It was it was actually good. And the footage they had in there was great from the Spanish Civil War. A great story. Um writers blowing their heads off, writers drinking themselves to death. It's a lonely life. Um, it's a solitary existence. It is. And, you know, anybody that isn't one has no idea of the torment it can be. I, I mean, from, from my thing is I don't sit down and doodle. I, I really have to just when it hits me, I'm going to do it and I'm not going to mm. do it until it hits me. Or if I have the practice of I have a larger project, I'm, I'm going to do it between these hours and this hours. One line, one sentence, 100 pages doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But. Yeah. yeah. Every writer has a different uh, methodology. So I'm, when you're I'm notoriously slow, I'm a, I'm a slow writer. So, but I'm not, I don't beat myself up if I don't hit a certain word count or anything like that, you know? You um, can't because you got to get it right. Are, so are you, a, say when are you're you taking, a, sorry, are you, a, are you a slow reader? No, I'm not. I read quite avidly. And then like, but I get, I was talking about this with a buddy the other day. When I, nowadays, when I come across something I really fall in love with, I tend to really slow down like halfway through it because I just want to live in it for longer or something. Are there and, books that you go back to? Because I, I have a few that I do go yeah. back to. Day what, of what the Locust. Go... Day of the Locust I go back to all the time. Um, Last Exit to Brooklyn. Um, yeah. Selby. Um, Walk on the Wild Side. Nelson Algren. Uh, those are kind of like my, my foundation. You know, and it's not to emulate or any anything like that no, it's, you right. can. it's just to ground to get yourself in the mental space of doing something authentic i think yeah. I, I go I always go back to tropic of capricorn and tropic of cancer in the summer months it's the same way that in the summer months i want to watch like you know butterfield eight and um who's afraid of virginia wolf and you know i want to watch elizabeth taylor and tennessee williams films yeah that's like my summer thing yeah, and we're in the summer, honey. I'm in my Elizabeth Taylor slip. I know you can't see me. I'm just showing a little <laughs> bit of it. Trust me, I'm there. How, how, how vast is your spectrum? I mean, with uh, with what you read. I mean, pre twentieth century. Pre twentieth century. Um, I got into some like J.K. Huseman's for a minute. Um, and like he, that was like eighteen. Was it eighteen ninety five? It was um, not against the grain. It was the against one nature. Birthday. Against against nature. Nature. It wasn't that one. It was the one with um. It's beautiful. The satanic one with the with the church. God damn, I can't think of the name of it. Steve Erickson talked about it in Zeroville, and then I got a copy of it. Um, I try to go back, you know, but at most everything I read is older. <laughs> I, right now, I'm trying to read something, some modern things, or like Buddy's books that kind of give me a a pulse on what what's happening right now because i'm pretty bad with that stuff. have you have you ever heard of craig clevenger who wrote yeah I, I just those books are great you what? yeah i just did an event i did an event with him on saturday and we're uh, we're going to be at book soup on july 14th oh, you know, i am a know. huge fan of dermaphoria and what was his other book called yeah. contortionist handbook yeah i'm a huge fan great. of those two books his, i his actually just gave Mother those two. I'm, I'm, Pardon I'm me? probably 100 pages in and it's if it just floor, floors you, man. I mean, talk about a unique voice. I, I just gave both of those books to somebody and I insisted, I actually was to Kevin Shea, the drummer of Retrovirus. I'm like, you have to read these. And um, please send my regards. Love to have them on the podcast. I love those books. They're great. Oh, yeah, they, they are both, they are also word. films on page. They're films on page. And those came out, I don't know, more than 10 Two, years ago, maybe. No, yeah. 18 years ago was when Dermaphoria came out. And, um, uh, this the new one is handbook. Is, Does he have a new uh, one out now? Handbook came out before that. I read Contortionist Handbook when I was in college because he went to Long Beach State as well. Okay. And I looked at that as like, oh, it, somebody came through this and it actually did something, you know? That's so I didn't know he was from there, and it's so interesting. I just pulled that out of both of our heads right now. Yeah. Came out. Yeah, no. It, I don't read that much modern fiction. Uh -huh. you'll love you his know. new one. I cannot wait. Maybe I'll meet him when I'm in L.A., when Tim and I are out there in a couple of weeks. When you guys I think you're going to be in New York when we're in Los Angeles. Though. So how do you know? So Tony O'Neill, he's great. And he's, yeah. you know, quote, quote, 
great blurbs for your book. And you're doing an event with him at KGB in New York, uh, July yeah. 27th, I believe. Yeah, I um, I reached out to him for a blurb because he uh, reading uh, reading Digging the Bane when it first came out and uh, Six City. It was a I just loved the style, and he was writing about the neighborhood I was living in at the time. You know, I was I was living in the East Hollywood area, and um, he I wasn't expecting anything. He read the book, he dug it, wrote me that killer um, yeah the killer blurb, and then he's like, yeah. he's already come through New York. We got to hang, and I'm like, well, you know, I'm budding this tour myself, so I, I don't think I'm gonna be there like unless a bookstore wants to do it and he's like no 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 kgb bar gave me all the stats and then said well and my so. advice to all writers is like don't just do bookstores you don't get paid get a freaking gig that's you know yes. get a gig get a gig yeah, i wish there were more i wish there were more bars like that you know like um but i'm i'm excited yeah well kgb good. bar that's where cecil taylor used to be hang quite a bit uh the the yeah, piano, play, piano player. <laughs> now, if only the books were written about what Cecil Taylor did at the oh, age. Someone's got it. I'm someone's got it. Someone's got it. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. So you're doing some promotion for your book now. So what does that involve? Where are you going? What's it about? And you are coming to New York, so that's yeah. Good. Um, so I uh I had to launch at the North Big Bookshop in Highland Park a couple weeks ago with Richard Lang, who's a great great author. Um. He's on Mulholland. His, his paperback of Rovers is about to come out, which was Stephen King gave it a great blurb. And then um, this weekend I was in Encinitas with um, Craig Clevenger, whose book Mother Hal just came out. And uh, my good pal, Jim Ruland, who um, his book Make It Stop just came out. He's uh, uh, he's uh, been the autobiographer or, or the biographer of uh, Keith Morris and the SST record book that just came out. Um, and then uh, I, I'll be at the Book Jewel in Westchester on July 8th at 6 p.m. And then July 14th, Friday, Craig Clevenger and I will be um, at Book Soup Sunset Strip, uh, 7 p.m. And then uh, I fly out to New York on the 26th for KGB on the 27th at 7 p.m. And when do you how long when do you stay how when do you leave New York? Um, I'm leaving that fall on Monday. Yeah, I'm staying well, right there. Well, that sounds like fun. Village. Do you enjoy do you enjoy live presentations? I love it, man. I mean, well, do I like doing them? <laughs> I'm getting I'm getting used to it. You know, it's one of the things I didn't think about when I sat in a room for 15 years trying to do something with my life. You know, even podcasts like this is probably my fourth or fifth, and um, it's still you know kind of elusive. You know, to get used well, to. Yeah, it. you know, we're just talking. It's it's not that hard. Come on. These are the best ones so far. You know, just not a, not as hard as writing a goddamn book, honey. Come on, not as hard. <laughs> I got to keep that in perspective. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. reading reading in, in public is is a it's a you got to exercise it. You know. Well, because let let's break this down for a minute. So. What is a book? But first of all, it's an onanistic obsession to complete, to mm. put out. And then it's an onanistic delight when you find something you like. So mm. when you're reading in public, it's like, uh, is this this is like the adult nursery room. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I kind of like that thought. actually. When you <laughs> when you told me it's three minute reads, I was like, oh, thank God. You know, because you we've all had those eight minutes where you're just like you can hear, you know, people falling asleep and uh, i'm sorry i never i've never had that problem but uh when i first started oh, I was, a maximum yeah. 10 minutes because people <laughs> were getting violent <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just the way it is just the way it is yeah absolutely well all of this sounds grand and i hope that people check out the rest of the your other books and also the other books that are on down and out books if they're into crime you know the thing about books and to me they're still very important i mean you know you have to it's Let's face it, especially an old book. It's the smell. It's the texture you're holding. It is very close to your face. It's a lot more intimate than um, watching television. Let's put it that way. And it's actually you have to employ the energy to do it or you have to be relaxed enough to be able to do it without, you know, your mind wandering. And once you get into something good, it just takes you into it. I mean, you're just then swimming on the page in somebody else's brain. And yeah. I have to say, I do like to dig deep. It takes courage to do that too, to submit to a text, you know, it, 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 to go into a bookstore and see something that you, you don't know what it is and to take a chance on it and, and purchase it. I mean, that that's something that's not talked about a lot. That's a big deal to me, you know? Right. Um, 
I, it, it doesn't it doesn't get lost on me every time somebody says anything about my my books. Um, yeah, it still blows my mind that there's readers, you know. It still blows my mind that there's any kind of an audience for anything, I must say. But it ain't going to stop us whether there is or whether it isn't, because this is the Liddy and Spin, and it's what the fuck we do. It's what we do. <laughs> we do what we fucking do. And that's what we do. So I'm going to close this out by saying thank you very much, Nolan Knight, and good luck on your upcoming dates. And uh, get that Craig Clevenger over to me as well. And this I will. is going up on I'll Friday. Send him. All right. Send him direct. <laughs> Send him directly <laughs> to me. And mail him to me and I'll I'll be here. <laughs> All right, I'll do it. Thanks so much and uh good luck with the book. It's a real it's a real teeth gnasher. Thanks yeah. so much. I'm yeah. glad, I'm yeah. glad thank, you thank you, Nolan. Thank you, Nolan.